It's about, um, for me, um, how someone can work their way out from nothing. Um, I might have to cut a few corners because at the beginning of the book, if you see the book, um, there's a, 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 I think it's a two line quote and it's so true of the world. Um, behind every great fortune is at least one crooked deal. Right, so you see the kid work his way out from nothing after his parents are slaughtered and his his older brother is slaughtered back in Sicily. Then you look at our, then you look at betrayal, uh, the attempt on his life, Marlon Brando. So forget the the attempt on me. Like, it could have come to that with my brother, um, because he fucked everything, my brother, and and um, he got involved. My brother got involved with someone he shouldn't have done. And then uh, there was direct threats on his life. And I stood up for him after he betrayed, already betrayed me in business and got me into numerous fights in previous years right. uh, because he always said, I'll go and get me brother. You know what I mean? And I said, you can't keep doing this. And then well, by the time you work out who's right and who's wrong, the majority of the time he was right, plus he's my brother. Um, but on the two occasions, betraying me in business over the houses and betraying me um, in business again and in his personal life and drawing me into a violent conflict, um, it all ties in with what I'm saying about the film. And that's me. Uh, uh, so, so I haven't spoken to him uh, for the last 20 years because, uh, so then you've got, then you've got a betrayal, then you've got counter betrayal, then you've got another betrayal. So all the stuff I've experienced at Leighton Orient, um, and at Millwall and, uh, and at Gillingham and, and at Chelsea, uh, betrayal, counter betrayal, people not staying, being true to their word, people lying to your face, people, um, scheming behind your back like Leighton Orient um, which I won't go into because I don't want to get litigious um, it's all in there in the film then I could then, you, then I, I feel like you're changing your, your choice there Johnny you're moving from no the, no I'm going to come listen I'm going to come to my choice I'm just telling you okay, how it could so. have been because like I don't want you to think I've just been dismissive of your questions and just fucking pulled up an answer My guest today is John Sitton, ex-football player, ex-football manager, legendary London cabbie and writer of his own book and he's got another one on the way um, and the first one is definitely well worth checking out. I first came across John from a YouTube clip that a lot of football fans will have seen of him giving a half-time team talk as part of a documentary where he was a little bit cross. Um, we do talk about that, but really what this episode does is it shows you the full sort of man behind those those clips and that documentary. And luckily, John is so um, straight talking that you definitely get to see the full man behind, uh, behind that. Uh, this episode is unflinchingly honest and all the better for it so yeah at times whether it be times the bits that are difficult or the bits that are funny it's all it's all gold as far as i was concerned and i could not edit this episode to be under an hour because there was nothing else that i could take out so for the final episode of uh wonders of the world what a great way to finish with john sitton and john sitton's seven wonders of the world okay so john from uh reading reading your book and from listen to quite a few interviews you've got out there and and stuff like that mm -hmm. i get the impression and you can tell me if i'm wrong here that you're somebody who is you know not you know not afraid to call a spade a spade but as well as sort of being critical when you think it's necessary you actually come across as somebody who is very enthusiastic and passionate about things that they enjoy or admire as well and in fact in the book the only thing you sort of don't come across as doing is ever sitting on the fence or or just thinking something's all right. It seems a bit like everything's a bit marmite to John Sitton. Is that a fair comment, or um, have I got you wrong there? I think it's very, very fair comment. If, I mean, it, if I think it's something worth making a decision over, if I think it's something worth talking about, debating about, um, cut, like, like I say, coming to a decision over, then um, I'm pretty definite. In, in 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 what I think should be the outcome. You know, I, I just think that's the way the world's gone now. And um, probably 
from a like, sort of I don't know like a self psychoanalysis point of view like I, I probably never I've never fitted in for different reasons lots of different reasons but I probably never fitted in and I definitely don't don't fit in with today because I think the um uh, too many millions billions and billions and billions of people they buy into the uh, ambiguity the seeds they buy into the seeds that are sown of ambiguity by um by the establishment and uh, they get they get and it's it's like a very intricately woven web and uh, uh, I think m most problems surround without taking too much on board, which I've obviously done. I've looking back with the benefit of hindsight, I've done too often throughout my life. The I just think like the, there's a solution to everything, but the, I think the ambiguity suits the powers that be. So we're in for a bit of a bit of black and white with you today, John. Well, I, I, I mean, it's the way I live my life. I think life's too yeah. short. I mean, I won, one minute I was 12, walking up the, in, into the marble walls of Ivory, and, uh, you know, with a, with a great deal of uh, trepidation, apprehension, nervous butterflies. And then the next minute, I'm 62 next month. So here we are 50 years later, and it's gone. People don't, I didn't believe it myself when I was playing cricket with my dad and um, my cousin's husband on, on the beach in uh, Jersey. And I was like, I wanted to keep playing. And like, my dad's like, like, give us five minutes, son. Let me, let me just have a breather. And I went, like, leave off. He said, no. He said, I'm 42 now. He said, I'm, I need a break. And uh, I just thought, it would take me ages to get to 42. And uh, here we are 50 years later. It's gone in five minutes. It's, um, in your book, John, one of the things, the really nice things that you say is, I can't remember the exact word you use, but you say something like, you need to suck the bone marrow out of life which is a quote that I like and sort of rings in with what you just said. So Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I mean, I believe that. It's what I used to tell my younger players. I used to I used to say, um, you know, I'm going to impart a lot of good information. Um, I'm going to help you improve your game. I'm going to I'm going to help organise you. And we, we managed to turn things around because obviously you've got to bear in mind, with all due respect, the utmost respect, because I was in one of the, um, at one of the bigger football clubs as a young player, you know, late night, they, they tend to get their, the leftovers, they get the, the dregs, they get what's left at the bottom of the teapot. You know what I mean? Everyone else is uh, cherry-picked by uh, the likes of Chelsea, uh, Tottenham, Arsenal, West Ham. It was even the case back then when I when I got the job in 93, 94. So I just said, like, that, you know, you've got to suck the bone marrow out of every day, use what you can use and discard what no, what's no good to you. And I, I, I tried to talk to them, I spoke to my own children. You know, they'll treat them like sons. And uh, that's just the way I did the job. It's the way I've always tried to do the job, and it's the way I'll do the job um, if I was still in it now. Yeah. Well, we're going to talk today about some of the things that you have enjoyed in your life. Um, I suppose we've got to start to some extent with what a lot of people will know you from and where I first sort of became aware of you, yeah, which is what is now sort of an infamous, uh, basically most people on YouTube, isn't it? It's an infamous YouTube clip of you delivering a half-time team talk. Now, for me personally, I have to say I found this really strange because I'd sort of become aware of this YouTube clip and I, I don't know what, what you'll think of this, but to me, it was just like a, a hilarious uh, bit of footage, basically. It was, it was the sort of, it's exactly the sort of thing that most football fans have wanted to say to their team at some point when they've seen, you know, them not pulling their weight. And it really seemed to me like a, you know, particularly colourful and slightly, um, comical version of a team talk that I'd been given when I was playing Sunday League at the time as a teenager and half of my team talks seemed to resemble that to be honest what I didn't realise and really just sort of really discovered is that for you that what like I said what, what might look like a sort of funny clip on YouTube actually had a massive significance for you in your life and, and the way that your career went and obviously we'll go straight to your first wonder of the world which is your book which is which is literally your book, um, A Little Knowledge is a Dangerous Thing by John Sitton. And I wondered if, to what extent was the motivation for writing that book um, an attempt to, or an opportunity to put your side of those events across? Because, you know, to anybody like me who's just watched a minute and a half on YouTube or whatever it is, you know, you don't get all that context of, of understanding that you, the situation you were in and all that sort of stuff. So was that what motivated you writing the book? And if so, what was the reason it took you so long to get around to writing it and you didn't feel like you were uh, you wanted to or able to put your side across much earlier? Yeah. Well, there's a lot in there. Um, <laughs> yeah, you've, you've basically um, 
compared me to a Sunday morning manager. Um, well, no, so I, I, I what, what, I might, what I meant by that was, I think um, for people who haven't, who weren't, who haven't been in around football, they yeah. might, um, they might think, uh, you know, they they might think, well, that's you know, particularly this guy's really lost it. Whatever. All I was saying that's was, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. for me, well, I never, I never watched it like that. I just thought that was just football. I mean, I was only playing obviously at a really amateur level. Yeah. And I, I, I thought that was normal at the level I was playing at, and I just took it as a given. And I and I, I think I'm, I was right in this that I, even at the top professional level, that that kind of team talk is happening. And you know, I think for, for whatever yeah. reason, well, yeah. because it was on camera, your yeah. one became famous and a big deal. But yeah. for for me and people that I know who like football, yeah. uh, the idea that people would be shocked by that or or treat you know think that was outrageous, I found that surreal. It was you know it took me a while to get my head around that really because I just took it as a given that that's what you know, what football dressing rooms are like, really. Does that make sense? So I was surprised only recently to learn that it had such an impact on your careers that, that it has had. Yeah, well, it's part of the duplicity, uh, duplicity, double standards and hypocrisy in football. I, know, I mean, I never, I never done what Ferguson did and kicked a boot in someone's eye and give him stitches. So I never yeah, done exactly, what, yeah. I never done what Frank Clark did, who I played under, and I had to pull him back with Frank Wolf, the commercial manager, when he ran up the tunnel to chin Keith Millen, who was... Uh, at best, a, a six out of ten centre back for Brentford, and went over the top on Stevie Castle in the centre cir centre circle, and nearly broke his leg at Brisbane Road. And I never, um, I never chinned a, a passive, very very timid ex West Ham midfield player. Uh, oh, I forgot his fucking name, Simon something. And uh, so I never did any of that shit. You know what I mean? It was just it was the threat, really. With regards to it being comical, what you saying, comical? Um, I suppose it is when you when you could sit there, you know, and you could sit back and you've got nothing at stake. But I was clinging on for dear life for um, basically uh, the remnants of like the, the sort of the career I was trying to build, having been a coach since I was 28. And I was now 34. And I think it was just, uh, it's like the, docu uh, the documentary uh, maker said, uh, a, a young lady by the name of Joe Trahan. She said, it's not my fault, uh, my fault if people in football, people who play football, people around football, if they've got two, two brain cells and supporters don't understand it. Um, because uh, fundamentally what I was doing in the end, um, firefighting all over the place, as I've mentioned, uh, I was juggling six jobs within the club, which is complete and utter uh, nonsense. And uh, anyone in their right mind which obviously I wasn't. They wouldn't have gone near the near the job in the first place if they'd have realised what they was going to end up doing, uh, eradicating a five hundred twenty thousand pound debt and turning it into between one seventy and two twenty in the black. Um, and it was like a complete and utter madness, borderline arrogance and narcissism on my part, where I thought I was going to influence the culture at the club and change the approach of the club and help the club because of me love for the club at the time uh, to stop it being patronised and patted on the head and like, oh, yeah, we, we had a good little game at the O's. Yeah, look, look the O's this, the O's that. Yeah, nice little ground, the O's. Yeah, I always enjoy going to the O's. Well, I always used to enjoy going to the O's because we always used to take three points. And I, I said to the chairman, like, I think maybe it'd be uh, fantastic, uh, raise the profile of the club and a bit of publicity. And instead of a documentary about the club and the circumstances around the club and um, the fact that I was juggling six jobs within the club, it, it ended up being a um, if you if you don't include the adverts, a fifty-three minute documentary of me ranting and raving, yeah. which I did. I basically did. It showed the four times that I've I lost it in the ten months that I was there. As, well, we're not there, but as a first thing. And that's why that's why the book's so valuable. I think like. Uh, oh, that was it. Yeah, yeah, that was it. You mentioned about the book. So anyway, in the book, let's get a book in there, John. Come on. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, basically, it was time. It was time because um, I spent eighteen months. Uh, my personal life was um, uh, all over the place. I was right. ostracised and outcast from football. Um, I was trying to. Uh, I don't know how I'm going to word this because I, I, I'm still I'm still struggling to think whether I'm going to put it in my second book or not. More revelations about about my private life, really, or revelations about my private life. But anyway, I was juggling all these things and uh, three small children, seven, four, and three, um, and then like me, me woman who I'd been with since the summer of '76, 
and uh, we're try trying to hold it all together. And in the meantime, I was um, basically re reliving the, well, the youth that I never had, really, because I was too concentrating too much on trying to be a footballer, mm. um, which is not, I'm not trying to make any sort of excuse for it, uh, for the way I conducted myself. And then um, you're talking about applying for jobs for 18 months, non-stop, every time I heard something was coming up, even going to games. And then I just got to the stage where I thought, you know what, fuck this, this is a waste of time. Yeah, and and that's, said, the, that's the bit I was getting at at the start, John. Like, that's the bit of it that, for me, is hard to fathom. And I only really can sort of appreciate having made your book because it just seems so bizarre that somebody would be shunned so heavily for like yeah. for like I say what what seems what seems to me like and I'm not belittling it but just it just seems like you know slightly comical is you know it's a nice turn of phrase in that in that in that rant but apart from that that that's the, it's, there's no headlines to me and I think that was what, what I was saying with the book is did you feel like the book was was a, a, a very, maybe a very delayed, like I said, for the reasons you said, but yeah, was it a yeah, delayed yeah. attempt to, to help people understand what was going on? Because like I said, you know, you, you, exactly that. somebody exactly like me, that. Just, was that what made you want to write the book or did it feel, was there some other reason or was it yeah, just no, maybe I, I, Yeah, uh, I, I think that was my, my main motivation, yeah. Yeah, and obviously when I was doing it, as I was doing it, I mean, basically I went out and did a shift Um so I used to do two in two in the afternoon till two in the morning in the, as a black cab driver, and then I was getting home. Uh, if I got to run north or east, round about midnight, I called it a night. Come home, sat there, and uh, made a tea, and um, had the news on in the background quietly, and then on the TV. And then I've, I've basically I've, I was writing writing with a biro because the people were saying, "Well, how did you do it? Who, did, who helped you?" And no one helped me. Yeah, I mean, you know, like I mean why, why, why are they, why are they so shocked? Like, just, like a blue collar working class kid who went to a comprehensive and walked out on ten O levels to become a professional footballer. Why, why are they so, so shocked that uh, I could get four pads of A4 and uh, and a couple of biros and, and do it longhand because I'm not computer literate? Well, that's what I did. I wrote until four o'clock in the morning or until I've, I've thought to myself, yeah, I'm going to give it a rest tonight. I think. Um, I've said enough, I've got enough off my chest, uh, which was the second motivation, as in it was quite cathartic. And I, I, I ideally, I wanted late Orient supporters um, who I thought, uh, thought something of me after, you know, 10, year, 10 years of ability, dedication, professionalism, passion um, and caring for the club. I thought they might want to see my side of the story. Well, yeah. it, ended, it ended up, out of all the books that I've sold, about 50 of them bought it out of an mm. average gate of about four and a half, about 50 of them bought it. So they'd obviously, um, they'd fallen under uh, the spell of Barry Earn. And they weren't, they, they weren't interested in what I had to say. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was, it was a cathartic exercise. I mean, motivation really was to tell my side of the story. And then, um, you know, I mean, it, you end up rowing in this, this sort of everything, everything, all that you write about, everything that leads to, to that point in my life in 2016, I suppose. Yeah. One of the biggest things that it did for me, John, is that if you, if you just, like I said, if you just go off that clip, you're just going to look at this guy and think he's a traditional English manager, you know, giving it the big bell and thunder. But actually yeah. what comes across is just your love of the technical aspects of the game and how much you, you know, coaching has actually a real passion and, and that is where your heart is and actually that's why that clip does you such a disservice because that whilst those values and that are important to you actually you're somebody like the impression i get you're somebody who really enjoys like i said the technical aspects of football and, yeah, did. and very modern yeah, did. sort of take like what at the time was, was a very modern take on things like playing coaching is like a voyage of self-discovery and uh the best coaches uh like i was um have got good imagination one of the best co uh, assets a coach can have is imagination and um i wasn't found wanting in that in that respect so i just said that's me done i walked out concentrated on becoming a black cab driver yeah you've um, you sort of led on to one of the things i wanted to ask you about from the book so i come away from it and one of the things i was a little bit um wanted to ask you about today is yeah. you, you i love how honest you are I and mean, you like say you know there's a bit right at the start that you say i've put my hands up, I've got regrets, I've made mistakes. And you sort of, it's clear that you regret having a bit of naivety, like you say, maybe in yep. accepting the camera crews and maybe a bit of um, over ambition on your part and taking the job on. What I wasn't sure about though, John, um, is do you, maybe not regrets the right word, but do you feel like you wish you had 
played the game a little bit more because it comes across that that's what you would have needed to do to have a successful career in football. So do you think, oh, I wish I had, you know, learned to play the game a little bit more or in your words, you know, laugh at a joke that I don't find funny or shake someone's hand if I don't respect them because that's what I need to do to, to succeed in football and have a career that I want and deserve. Or do you sort of feel like, no, I'm glad I stuck to who I was because although that maybe cost me my career in football or at the very best would have always made it hard for me to have that career in football, ultimately that authenticity and, and who I am is more important. Does that make sense? Do, do you regret that side of it? Um, yeah, I think I do, yeah. yeah but I can't change your I am. I mean, my wife has always smoothed the path in front of me and tried to soften any blow. Um, or, or or bump in the road that I come across and she said uh, basically uh, you're better off out of it football don't deserve you anyway mm -hmm. um, you're too good for those people these type of expressions you know which is nice of her um, but you I mean you can't you can't change who you are and, and I think in the end it's all about fate and if, if it's brought me to that uh, juncture where um, I'm judged on something I said um I just think to myself, you know what, uh, you, I've, I've reconciled myself and I think in the end, you, you, you're a little bit more, although never completely, but a little bit more comfortable in your own skin. That's what I was saying, like, I mean, it, it, I think of it as a, as a dad myself, you got to, you know, when you're talking to your kids or whatever, do you advise them to, you know, learn how to compromise or, you know, they'll say it sell out a little bit sometimes, you know, to to get to where they need to go or do is your fundamental message yeah be true to yourself and yeah. don't and, and i was i was wondering whether which of those which side of that you know corn you come down on well I've, well I've used a little bit of both and then obviously they're um you know if i've got the oldest one in recruitment the the mid uh, so that's a that's my oldest girl lucy then i've got the second one georgina she's a metropolitan police officer then i've got my third one jack who's in it well, they're, they're obviously like human beings and they've, they've got their own uh, levels of intelligence. So I've done a little bit of both of what you said. Um, and uh, because at the end of the day, uh, life's too short, honestly and truly. Uh, and, and a little bit, they've worked it out with, with their own intelligence um, how not to behave, how not, how, how not to, uh, as you put it, to play the game and how not, how not to be uh, in, in uh, with regards to my, my example. Um yeah, so I've done a little bit of both of that and then I've, I've left left the rest of them and they've, they've worked it out for themselves quite rightly. Uh, the bottom line the bottom line is it was it was um uh, I'm being honest here. I think it was um 100% honest. I think my ideas, my aspirations, um my ambition was far too big for the club that I was at. And uh, I mean that. Um what they did to me was like a dagger to the heart. And um, but I'm over over it now. I'll t people go, oh, you sound angry and bitter. I'll go, yeah. Well, now what? Yeah, what are you going to do about it? You've asked me a question. I've answered the question truthfully, factually, how I feel, and then I get accused of being angry and bitter. Well, yeah, you're going to talk, yeah. talk to me about something that I've got yeah. a right to be angry and bitter about. I'm going to come across as angry and bitter. So oh, yeah. That on, on that note then let's 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 yeah. leave that behind then so uh, just before we go though before we go from the book i genuinely yeah wicked book mate like really good really enjoyed it and yeah it was definitely a good read especially for football fans obviously um yeah, okay so let's let's get away from football and let's get on to some of those other things that you may be not angry and bitter about and that you've already touched upon as well and they even though the book's mostly about football even then it still shines through that the, the other the other big part of your life is family isn't it so we're going to go to your place which is the border of Spain and France. And am I right in thinking this is, so this is the roots of your family then, is it? Tell us about this then, John. Uh, well, yeah, very quickly, although uh, <laughs> oh, there's an heavy, heavy irony attached because um, I haven't spoken to my brother for probably 20 years now. Um, you know, he, he's, you know, different bits and pieces have happened along the line and he betrayed me in business. And he, he brought me into uh, a betrayal in his personal life. And it could have led to some very, uh, very deep, very dark happenings. And I said, that's me done. Um, because I'm not, you know, at the time I put me, um, I put myself on the line for him. And then when it was all the dust settled and it was all done, I just said, that's, that's me and you done no more. 
Um, but what he'd done, he paid a lot of money to trace the family tree and put, he concentrated on the maternal side. Um, but also me, me dad. And uh, apparently the family tree can be traced, be traced it back to the early 1500s to the borders of France and Spain. Um, and I know like my granddad on my mum's side, who was the one that we knew really best, um, you know, he, he had a very colourful life and a very colourful history and lots of myth and legend around him. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, that's fundamentally, uh, although I haven't been to seen the place, he, he actually had actually named the place, the town. Uh, I haven't actually been to see it yet, but I would love to go. I'd love to go one day. But oh, I've, I've t always tended to be drawn to, to Spain for some reason. Um, I even had an affinity when I was secondary school. It was one of the O levels I was going to take. Yeah, but latter day, I've, I've you know I've become more political, which is apparently what the people that I come from they were they were very political. They got a say in yeah. there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the saying in their language is uh, "fuck the man." What? Yeah, yeah. It's a it's a saying. It's a saying from that uh, region. And when they raise a glass, they say cheers, and then they raise it again and say "fuck the man." Yeah, I. So there's a streak of streak of that in you, then, John. Oh, well, there is latter day, yeah, because in football you live in a bubble, don't you? I mean, right. I did. So, is there is there some scenario where you end up retired and uh, sitting somewhere in the yeah, yeah, North yeah, of Spain, yeah. John? Is that dream? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah there is. I, I mean, it should have been done already because I had five houses, and my brother betrayed me in business, and now all I'm doing is working and living hand to mouth like everybody else because I'm, my trade's been slaughtered by Uber for the last nine years. Um, I, I but, uh, I'm trying to. I said to my wife, either there or Cyprus, because I love Cyprus. I first went there in 1980. You know, right. You well, know I like mean? the fact, John, that you're the first person whose who's place is not somewhere they've been, but somewhere they want to get to. I like that. It's a good. Uh, it's a good note for us. So, yeah. sticking yeah. with your family, one one thing again that comes across over the book is the importance of your grandfather. Um, is is a really strong character in in, in your life, isn't he? And he, your third um, wonder of the world is, is a possession, which is a ring that I believe belonged to him, John. Yeah, it should have been mine. Uh, I ended up with a uh, Mickey Mouse mahog mahogany table and chairs from me. Oh, so you ain't got the ring then? No, I never got the ring. My brother got the ring. Yeah, and, he, and he's ruined the ring. He's, he's added two more diamonds to it. What it was, it was uh, um, allegedly my, my, my granddad was a Diddy Coy. I don't know if you know what that is. You have to explain that to me, yeah. Right, Diddy Coy is, um, it's a slang word for uh, a rough gypsy. Yeah. This is your granddad, this is on your dad's side, or your mum's side, sorry. My mum's side, on my mum's yeah. side, yeah. They're, yeah, they're so all this is dad we're talking about, yeah. Yeah, they're all very dark, all very dark skinned, olive yeah. skinned, and uh, yeah, like magnificent, yeah, big blue eyes, lovely wavy curly hair, um, man amongst men. Apart from stepping up to the plate when your dad was falling short, how would you sum up the contribution that your granddad made to your life, John? I never, well, it's funny. Uh, probably, probably more than I can um, articulate because it's like when my time comes, I, I will, I will, I'm going to try and comfort my children in the best way that I've, I've, I know how, which is how I've comforted myself because I lost him. I was very, very, very young, but he, he's certain traits have lived on in me. So it's like I'm gonna say to my kids, I'll always be there because I'm I'm in you. You understand? So yeah. the 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 you know the, the, the certain things that he tolerated didn't tolerate. Um, he was just a, an old school. He looked like James Cagney. To be fair, I met I, and I remember I went. I, I had to go. For, I had to go for some thing with my wife, um, and uh, to talk to people. And then I remember breaking down talking about him. And really? uh, yeah just it's just um yeah i mean like the, the, it was it was a ring and a, a very valuable ring in terms of the gold and the diamonds but i won't really I, it's not it's not a case of the being bothered about the the value of the ring it was the case of me being the first born son and he made such a fuss of me because i was the first boy born into the family um but yeah you look at the things like work ethic you look at things like the imagination uh the, the, harry used his imagination to try and uh get, you know, get business accumulating businesses shops stalls land property um 
and and delegating responsibility and then micromanaging, like I said yesterday. And it's like another thing I was thinking about yesterday, going back to something you said earlier um, about playing the game. The ones that play the game, let me put this to you. The ones that play the game and tag along, right? But let me put this to you. It's not the ones that tag along and the ones that in inverted commas, uh, quote unquote, play the game that change the game or come up with new things, uh, new initiatives within the game or come up with ideas um, and come up with new strategies, the likes of Alison, Venables, etc. The ones that come up with it are the Mavericks. The ones that come up with it think outside the box and are a little bit different and a little bit quirky and a little bit uh, understated, overstated. Um, just come up with stuff off at a tangent and then all of a sudden it becomes en vogue. Yeah, I guess you can't you can't switch that quality off, can you? So again, no. like, sorry if I'm wider them up, but you know the, the the reason that you got yourself into to bother with the documentary is also part of that is as part of your personality, which is to have ambition and to be you know to be willing to be a maverick, and that comes from your granddad, and you can't just switch it off when it's convenient, and then be do you know what I mean like you can't be both of those people. So I, I guess to some extent, my conclusion there would be. Yeah, that, that, like I said, that is who you are and that is who he'd want you to be. Does that make sense? He wouldn't want you to be John who plays the game. He'd want you to be John, the man who, you know, who yeah. he wanted you to be. Is that fair? Yeah, yeah, don't, yeah don't get me wrong. He was he was crafty and clever. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, which has been times when I've, I've been uh, crafty and clever and diplomatic. There's times when I've just been straight in your face and straight like um, and out there and fuck it. You know what I mean, and 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 not yeah, not and not really give too much of a monkey's about the consequences. And I've been lucky. I've been very lucky in a lot of areas with with regards to that. Um, not thinking of the consequences. Yeah. Let's go on to your next wonder, John, which is your album, and it's the uh, sound. It's a famous soundtrack, isn't it, John? Tell mm. us a little bit about uh, this album and why it's been. Your, what was your choice today? Yeah, well, I mean, it's like um, other bits and pieces, questions that you've asked me. I could have, I had so many choices, uh, so many choices because I was brought up on music with family gatherings, family parties. Music was always on. My mum always had the radio on. We always had a, the up, most up-to-date record player. Uh, they used to call it a gramophone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, parties at um, bonfire night. Would go from uh, you know stuff outside to you know music and drink inside. Uh, same at Christmas. Same as same with birthdays and so massive. What sort of music? What sort of music's on in the family home then, John? Well, coming up, it was always things like uh, what would now be regarded. Well, actually, they was called it uh, back then the Rat Pack. So like Dean Martin, uh, oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Sammy Davis, Sinatra. Um, my dad, uh, in particular, like Tony Bennett. Uh, well, when I went and saw him in concert, I took my wife to see him in concert. Nice. Um, things like um, Elvis Presley was was massive. Um, but from a, uh, my own point of view, in terms of uh, time span, I just think when I was at my absolute optimum level, uh, it actually it might have signaled the, 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 the beginning of the end for me because um, I realised very quickly if I didn't change, go back to my previous habits, I would have slipped out of the game. At Chelsea, but uh, it's Saturday Night Fever. Yeah, um, which is uh, I, I saw the film six times, right? Um, and just I'll be honest with you, um, it sounds again, it sounds a bit narcissistic. It sounds idiotic. It's like uh, if I look at parallels in my own life, I just don't think they've whether it's playing at Chelsea, whether it's um, playing at any club really any of the four clubs I was at whether it's coaching or managing um, the parallel begins and ends there but I don't think they've ever really had the credit for the unbelievable talent and uh, catalogue uh, that they've blessed the world with and everyone goes on and on and on about the Beatles the Beatles the Beatles, this and that you know what I mean and I just think like for me it's the Bee Gees they're my number one and uh, yeah it was a great it was a great era it was a great time I mean, it wasn't a great time for the country, but from a personal point of view, selfish point of view, um, I was round about that age where you start to get out and about 17, 18. Um, I was making good progress in football, at Chelsea Football Club. 
and um, enjoying life. And uh, that was that was the soundtrack to it, really. For most for most of us football fans, John, who grow up, you know, when you're a kid, everyone thinks they're going to play for England, don't they? I can't even begin to imagine what that's like when you're hitting your sort of mid to late teens and you're, you know, you're you're coming through and you feel like you've got the world at your feet. Yeah. But it just, I can't, the excitement and, I don't know, it must just be off the charts, absolutely off the charts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The obvious yeah. question I've got to ask is, were you, were you dangerous on the dance floor, John? I used to, I've always got up and had a dance, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. I weren't bad, yeah, I weren't bad, I weren't bad. It's still even now. And uh, yeah, yeah, why not? At the end of the day, it's an expression. And uh, at, at the end of the day, it's um, the things, one of the things I'm most passionate about, and it probably ties in with, even though it's like much further south where it supposedly originated, um, my favourite form of music is Latin music. I said it will be big about 10 years ago, and it, and it, and it became big. Um, uh, and out of that, if you ask me to pick a particular genre, it would be flamenco. And I'll make a point every year, and I think it's to do with um, something that sort of cries out to me, you know. Um, In the bones. Yeah, and nice. I, lo I love it. I can't get enough of it. Oh, good man, mate. I, I like dancing. I don't know what I, do. I don't know what I'm going to do with the uh, flamenco music, there, John. I'm a little way off that yet. No, I'll leave that to the experts. <laughs> I'll leave that to yeah. When I see them play and when I see them dance, I'll leave that to the experts. But when I get there, when I go, we go to Saddle as well. Every year, there's been a flamenco festival uh, take my wife and children oh, and nice. um and uh yeah I, I i tend to get quite emotional uh, all right yeah it's just a it's just a thing it's just a thing with me i can't explain it yeah that's good that's music you know that's music yeah. okay so your next um your next one of the world is your memory john and it's the birth of your kids um this is something i've experienced and to say, it's the same, the obvious says, powerful experience and that you birth your children. Could you, I guess you get just asked all the time to describe what it's like to score a goal. If you had to try and describe what it's like to be there at the birth of your kids, how would you try and put that into words, John? Incomparable. You can't. You can't. That's it? Well, it's the most powerful thing I've ever experienced. Yeah. 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 Did, did you, uh, again, it's maybe a cheap question, did you cry with the first one? Oh. Well, you can't see me. I'm I'm, I'm thing now. I'm struggling now. Are you well enough, mate? Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I did. With my first one. I, I cried um, it all three. I cried it all three of them. Did you? Yeah, because uh, the first one, um, my wife was in labour for 18 and a half hours. And yeah, they tried it's similar, everything. mate. Either our first day was yeah. really long. Yeah, really long. I, I didn't want to see her suffering. Yeah, it's hard, isn't it? Um, yeah, I saved it. I saved it for further down the line. The suffering um, and everything that I'd we battled, worked so hard for to create, I nearly blew it. When she came, when she came out, Lucy, my oldest one. Um, and she, she's got quite a bit of me and my family in her um, in terms of her ways and in terms of her attitude and thing. She's changed her middle name to her mother's name. Our, our, her, her middle name was after her godmother, which is my wife's sister, my sister-in-law. But because she wounded her, she, she's, the, she's like me. She can go very spiteful and vindictive and she, she changed it by depot. But when she came out, right, um, I tried everything on my wife, epidural, uh, oxygen, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, in the end, natural birth. And when she came out, right, um, this is no exaggeration. It's like she'd just come out of a bath. She was perfect. Oh. Flawless, absolutely flawless skin. Beautiful. Flawless facial features, beautiful heart-shaped lips and uh, big eyes and just even right from the minutes, the thing it was stunning. And then the second one, Georgina, who's named after my mother-in-law and my mum, Georgina Daisy, she came out and she came out how she's been. And then all of a sudden, it's all, which is like very tiny, petite and sort of borderline vulnerable, um, but never weak. 
um, and all of a sudden, <laughs> as she come in, as she come into her late teens, she 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 blossomed into a into a woman who who basically, I mean, it's now like even um, some of her, some of her male colleagues in the Met, <laughs> they sort of they sort of stand back. So she, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she can she can be quite ferocious that one. And then and then and then we wanted a son. I wanted a son. Yeah, so we kept trying. We kept trying, and we we could have had six, but we lost three. Oh, and uh, yeah, for different reasons, you know. So uh, it wasn't meant to be. But then but we had three in four years, and then we says, you know, we pulled the drawbridge up and quit while we're ahead, and because uh, I got my son, and he come out, and he was an absolute beast. He already had, he, he was like a mini Tyson. He already had shoulders and biceps. You know what I mean? Super. And uh, yeah, broke down again. Yeah, yeah, it's fantastic. Strong as a ball, he was. They all, they all was. They were all up in the higher eights. So eight, eight, twelve, eight, ten, eight, 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 nine. I think Jack was nine, one. So they were all big. You know what I mean? And uh, it, the most powerful thing you'll ever see. Yeah, it's just, it's just mind blowing. Isn't it? Your, your first birth sounds a lot like our, our the birth of our first child. And um, I don't know about you. I can because, like, yeah, my other half, she, she'd been going through it for hours, like hours and hours. And to be honest, mm -hmm. I think. If I'm being honest, up until that point, you sort of think, you know, I'm the man and I'm, I've got to look after and all that. And then you just see, you just see them do this. It's like so heroic what they do. Yeah. You know, you know have given birth. It's just, yeah. You, you can't get your head around it. And I think, I think not only did obviously I hold this baby and I'm looking at this baby and thinking my life's changed with this baby, but also looking at my partner as well and just thinking, you, you know, you're just it's like having a hero in, in your house. Do you know what I mean? It's mad. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So she, she comes across, um, you've talked to already about her already, your partner, there's somebody who's, who's definitely always in your corner. You Like you said, you've had you, you, you share that bad luck, but you share good luck. And I'm guessing meeting her and having her in your life has been a massive, massive slight slab of good luck for you, John. Yeah, it might be right. My brother in law, he says, um, we saved you. Because I've, I've come fundamentally from a unbelievably money-getting, like core family value, centre of the community type family, um, with a big work ethic, and then it just disintegrated overnight. And I was lost, and it ended up, um, you know, we're not so tight now for the last few years. But um, I've known my brother-in-law since we were six when he, his mum dragged him kicking and screaming into the playground in school because he didn't want to start school. And then I put my arm around him and said, come and play football. And then we've been mates ever since. And that's how I met my missus. Yeah, yeah, by getting me, me foot in the door there. And then even the mother-in-law, <laughs> she, she started saying, uh, why does John come around so often? <laughs> and then and then one day, um, I was having dinner. So, you know, the, my father-in-law, my mother-in-law, they was always renowned for their hospitality yeah and the Greek um, family aren't they? yeah yeah greek cypriot yeah my mother-in-law came over in 1947 and my father-in-law 1948 may he rest in peace when it was still a british colony oh. to find to find work and uh there was no work there so they came over anyway we was having dinner and then one night she said something she was quite terse and and then uh, sort of walked out of the room to do something in the tv room and I, I thought I'd done something wrong, betrayed etiquette or something, because I, I ate like a combine harvester. I, sh I mean, Greeks eat, but they could eat. But I, sh I even shocked my father-in-law. Because um, obviously I was a growing boy at the time. I was 16. And um, I said, I, so I asked me, me missus, what, what, did, what happened to your mum? What, why was your mum annoyed? What did she say? And she said that Tom, Tom my brother-in-law, he butted in and he said, my mum said to my sister, watch yourself. She said, you're, you're talking with your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> you're talking with your eyes. Yeah, so I, I could see you flirting with him. Uh, be careful. Anyway, is, they had no control over it. My father-in-law, bless him, he was always in my corner, him and my brother-in-law. Wow. I mean, the mum the and all the aunts, I mean, they turned out just like nasty, spiteful, vindictive, malignant cunts, a lot of them. Um, and then Auntie Chris uh, made disparaging remarks about my appearance and uh, you should be marrying a Greek boy. Uh, they all wanted to uh, uh, marry a Greek boy, which is what they yeah. do. But the, the father-in-law said, no, you can't, you, can't, you can't stand in the way of nature. You've got to let it take its course. 
Yeah, so it's a romantic story, really, isn't it, John? You know, go, like loving against the, against the odds sort of thing or against the grain, as it were. It didn't feel like it at the time. Didn't it? Just felt like hard work. Well, I think my, I think my missus, if the truth be told, I could see it in her face. I could see it in her eyes. I could see it in her, in her body language and her disposition. I think she thought um, at one time that uh, I was thinking this is too much aggro. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and it, it, it's not worth the aggro, it's, and it ain't worth the trouble, and it's too much trouble, and the thing, you know what I mean? And it's, it's just becoming a chore when it should be the most exciting time in your life. Yeah. But we somehow managed to fight through it, battle through it. She took stick off the English, um, and I, stuck, I took stick off the Greeks, and at the end of the day, they're ignorant fucks, you know what I mean? And it, ironically, all our peers... Uh, cause I was the ex Xenon, uh, which is the great word for foreigner. Uh, I was the outsider. Um, and, uh, it went from that to like, what's she doing with him? Uh, to, uh, it went from that to what's he doing with her? You know what I mean? And then I got the, she got the stick off the English. Are you still going out like at Chelsea, like ignorant, um, absolute scum cunts who like are you still going with that uh, little fat greek bird um except you know so fucking ignorant uh because obviously physically we're all still developing do you know what i mean but yeah, yeah. i fucking i love i loved every inch of her f- from day one uh she had a smile that would light up a room beautiful big almond shaped brown eyes black hair dark skinned um for me a lovely figure um, because I've always said jokingly, the bigger the woman, the bigger the playground. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know when we're going to cut that out, John. And then, uh, yeah, we went. I remember my dad come the first Millwall game. I signed a Millwall, and there's a, 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 a geezer gives my dad a leaflet outside the ground. So, um, my dad screwed it up and put it in his pocket. So my missus go, well, like, what's that, Reg? And he went, oh, nothing. It's just a thing, just a leaflet, a flyer. So the geezer who's giving them out, he's overheard the question, and he said, it's uh, a leaflet for our organisation, darling, to keep people like you out of the country. Jeez. Yeah, National Front. Jeez. Yeah, fucking absolute human filth. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? But I had it as well from the Greeks. So you just think... Uh, I think I went off the point er- earlier. Like, uh, ironically, all our peers who uh, had arranged uh, courtships in inverted commas, arranged and go arranged marriage, Brock Senya, they're divorced. They're on their third or fourth missus. Yeah, when you have a family, you have your Hollywood moments, don't you? Like holding the first, you know, holding the baby for the first time. But let's be honest, there's a bit, it gets sometimes it's not quite as fun as all that, is it? And it gets a little bit tricky to put it mildly. I'm yeah. guessing, I'm guessing you two have been been through quite a lot of adversity already, so that must have stood you in. Quite a good stead for the for the tough times, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I agree. It's uh, probably it's good grounding, you know. I yeah. mean, def- there's, there's there's no way, shape, or form uh, you can't you can't say that um, my, like my mother in law or anyone else made it easy. And then when um, I wrote, I think I, I think she still got it. I, I mean, I, fr- I threw it out in a in a thing in a, in a with a load of old leather bags. I put it in the thing down the local recycling thing, and she went. I had all your letters in that. Anyway, I had to drive her down there. We had to get the geezer to unlock the thing in the local recycling centre so I could get the bag out and take all the love letters and poems out of the, out of the bag. Well, these are poems that you've written in your... Yeah, or just like a love letter. What I, love the way it, I, the, Yeah, the way I see our future, etc. Anyway, when my, my father-in-law found out about it, I got, I got thrown out of the house with my father in, until we'd done his inquiries. But he said, he said to my, my mother-in-law, he's a good boy. He comes from he comes from a good family. He's a good boy. He's a very good boy. That's how they talk. He's a very good boy. We got married in the summer of 1982, but we've been together since the summer of 1976. Yeah, it's good. Good romance in that, mate. Good on you for, for uh, getting there. Because you like, yeah. That's how many years are you now? Like, must be yeah, 45. And that is a, like, yeah. Forget about other things. People achieving their lives. That is genuinely a, a legit. Proper achievement at 45 years together. Yeah, so yeah. let's move on to your person then, your sixth wonder of the world as a person, Miss Your Mum. I think you say in the book that you was a, a mummy's boy. So tell us about your mum and uh, what she what she meant to you, John. Um well, I'll have to keep it short really, because I get emotional whenever I think about her, uh whenever I talk about her, but she's just um um unbelievably soft and kind. 
um, friendly, compassionate, caring, uh, nurturing, helpful. I mean, the local community was basically the, the, the turnout that she got for her funeral. I'll never forget it. It was similar to me granddad's. Because, like, when they, you know, you've got to understand, like, you know, she she was cooking for me granddad's workforce, which was, like, upwards of 30, 30 men. And then, um, you know, we were, we were getting old. Our family was getting older stuff left, right, and centre. Um, and what she did, she very kindly, when other people were falling on hard times, she would, uh, they would come shopping to try and get a little bit. And she knew they might have, like, four, five, six, seven, eight kids and she'd give them a load of extra for free of charge. And they always remembered her for that. Uh, so that they, like all the other old Dorises could feed their families. Um, but she, uh, yeah, I mean, she never raised her hand to me once in all my life. It doesn't matter how much, how naughty I was. Uh, nothing was too much trouble. Um, yeah. Oh, and, I, and I had no, what it was, it was a shock to the Greeks who were very outward going, uh, they, they normally like, like very, very outward going. Sort of you know, things, sort of thing. Yeah, displays of affection. But they were shocked when they saw my relationship with my mum and how I, I was all over and put my arm around her, cuddled her, kissed her in public at the weddings and the engagements. And uh, we went to a couple of Christmas do's at the Grosvenor um, when the Greeks used to hire it for New Year's Eve and stuff. Um, yeah, they, they were shocked. And they were going, you really love your mum, don't you? So I said, yeah. And um, yeah, it, it's just... Uh, Good memories, good memories. Yeah. Uh, but she was probably a little bit too trusting. She got, she got, uh, she was very naive and trusting. She got totally manipulated by her sister and by my dad. I mean, if it was now, I mean, I'd step in. If, if, even if I, when I was an adult, you know what I mean? Um, but yeah. How old, very old. How, how old were you when she died, John? 28. 28. That's too young, isn't it? She was 56. Yeah, it's too young, that. And what made it worse was within six weeks, my dad was wrapped around somebody my age. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it all, it all turned to shit in the end. Now, it's never a truer saying. You know, I mean, when you when you look at things, uh, some of the stuff, the writing on The Sopranos, it's, and, uh, it's just unbelievable the stuff, how it's true to life. And then uh, something happens, and then he says to his missus, in the end, everything turns to shit. And it's true. It does. It does. It's so true. It's so profound. Very basic language, but so true and so profound. Oh, John, you, you're bumming me out, mate. Mm, mm. Well, I think, I suppose, like I said, on one hand, it's a, it's a tragic personal event for you, losing your mum. But I guess yes. at the yeah. same time, you also, in the same bit of speech, you're also able to talk about the memories that you got of her. And I suppose, I don't know whether this is trite, but it's trying to trying to be grateful for the for the good times we have with people that matter to us, you, you know. It's That's not, right. Not yeah. easy, is it? I I probably one of the best childhoods anyone could ever have. And that's a credit to your mum, isn't it? Because if your dad wanted yeah. to be doing it, that's a credit to your mum, isn't it? Yeah. And it only started to turn when she became ill. When I was 14, she became ill for the first time, 1974. You know, but up to 14, everything was good. There's a lovely story about your mum from the book, John, which lead us on to your seventh one of the world for me. So you tell a story about something bad happened to you. I can't remember if it's, whether it's um, being dropped by Chelsea or, or something else. I can't remember what, what's caused it. But your mum's, yeah. your mum's consoling you in the book and she says, I'm going to read it, I'm quote you in, mate. She says, you can't be beaten. You're not beaten until you're buried. And even then you can come back and haunt them. Yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 I like that. It's a bit, you know, it's a bit sinister in there. You said your mum's a really soft woman, but, you know, there's that... There's that gutsiness, obviously, to her. She obviously had that side. And that takes us on to your film, which is Raging Bull, John, um, which is, you know, about... Uh, a, could have been The Godfather, part one. Could oh, have been... Yeah. The, could, could have, um, I could have gone with The Kite Runner, uh, oh, which, yeah. uh, which is which is alongside a book that I read, which is about, you know, which is about, uh, for me, it's about forgiveness and redemption. Uh, I could have gone with The Last Samurai with regards to it. Listen, I can put the thing on now and I can fast forward it to the scene where the ninjas are, are, are sent to uh, assassinate the uh, the leading samurai of this clan. And when they have the fight, they, they put up a cry at the end. And I'll guarantee, I will guarantee 
it'll uh, my adrenaline will rush and it will make it will make the because uh, that's the level I got to. So the it picture I'm getting, John, is that when you watch a film, you're somebody who properly gets into a film. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's, yeah, there's, yeah. A, there's a lot of films that you. Yeah. really identify with it's not yeah, just yeah. sitting down yeah. choosing popcorn you listen that. to that you listen to the blood curdling cry it's almost as if he's saying um oh is everyone all right are we okay and then the, the cry goes up uh the, the goosebumps I, I feel the goosebumps come up um because that's where i am uh, that's just that's just me. So, but that's about honour. That's about pride. That's about a code. That's about a way of living. That's a, that's about being stubborn. That's about not giving in. So this uh, would actually that's it. I'm going to rush you along at uh, Agent Ball then, John. Because I'm conscious of how much of your time I'm taking up. So I'm intrigued about the the, the choice of Agent Ball because some of those characters you talked about, they're slightly more straightforward um, heroes or people to admire. Whereas the the, the main character in Agent Ball. He's a very, I know you said you like it black and white, but he's, he's a very compli complicated character, isn't he? Yeah. And there's there's a lot, there's a lot to um, dislike yeah. about him, isn't there? But then he's got this. Yeah, he's yeah, got that's this... me. Yeah, that's me. Right, he's, go on uh, then. Break this down uh, for me, John. Well, no, it's just, that's me. That's right. me in a nutshell. Uh, uh, he's a, he's a, uh... You're a nicer guy than him, aren't you, John? Please tell uh... me that. Well, I, I, listen, I'll, I'll, I'll admit to, this is my own, like I said to you earlier, it's like my own, um, sort of self self examination, you know, psycho psychoanalysis, if you want to put it like that. I'm, I'm I can be a difficult person to like sometimes. I can be a difficult man to love. Yeah. And and I don't know. What do you want me to say? Is he, you look at it, and he's got this um, stubborn, pig headed take on being an alpha male, which I had. Um, he's got this stubborn pig-headed way of he's going to do it his own way because of his pride, which I had, when in the end he needs the help of the mafia to get a title shot. Um, and then you look at how it all goes fucking tits up like it did for me at Chelsea because he started living the eye life, overeating, drinking, not going out, nightlife, going big time Charlie, uh, treating his missus like, like a doormat because he, was go he, he just wanted to go out and be with the chaps. Um, and then taking like taking her out and being being in nightclubs and all that when he should have been watching his weight and training then you look at how he turns on his brother um and then basically the realization of it, it it's just been a, a complete clusterfuck and uh, a lot of times all along he was he was wrong and he's he's ended up trying to cuddle his brother and admit that he was wrong but it, it, it but what it is a bit like the godfather what happens is you you forget uh, the immediacy of what's in front of you because you're looking beyond that and what, what's beyond that is not important. What's important is what's uh, directly in front of you, the immediacy of what's in front of you, uh, that minute, that hour, that day. And I, I'll just, that's what I'll deduce from it, that realisation um, and uh, maybe maybe a little bit of forget. You, you see at the end, you know, before I was blind, but now I could see. Um, may do a quote from the Bible at the end. Scorsese does a quote from the Bible at the end. And that, the thing that got to me when I first saw it, it was 1980, I just moved to Millwall and I said, this film's coming out to my missus. This film's coming out. Um, I'm, we're going to go and see it um, at Haymarket. And um, the the Odeon on Haymarket. And uh, I'm really looking forward to it. it. went down now. And within five minutes, I nearly crumbled. Because he said, because I'd just been let go by Chelsea. And... Um, who the fuck is this on this folder? Who's reading me this fucking Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a fucking estate agent. 
You know what mm-hmm. I mean? And, she, and she's effing and blinding. She said, like, are you going to come and fucking look at this place because I'm stuck in traffic? What a way to conduct yourself. <laughs> <laughs> and a, pro, a pearly state agent. It is to bring a dinner, mate. So, <laughs> <laughs> so where, where were we, mate? We, you were talking about the main character. Watching the, yeah, no, watch the yeah. film and it cut you off a bit, yeah. Yeah, no, thanks for jogging me memory. Yeah, what it was, I'd just been let go by Chelsea and uh, he's sitting with his brother. Um, he's just had a, white, a row with his missus. Uh, over a steak, the way she cooked a steak, and um, his, bro- his, his, young, his younger brother comes in, played by Joe Pesci, and he's he just says, uh, "What's the matter with you? You know what I mean?" He, he obviously distracted. He's, fit, he's going, he's overthinking stuff, which I've done all my life, and um, he just said, um, "Look, look, look at these hands." He said, "Look at look at my some." I'm paraphrasing slightly. Look at look at my hands, Joey. And he went, well, what about me? He said, well, they're small. He said, well, they're your hands. So it's like, like, he said, well, yeah, but he goes, they're, they're like, a, they're little, they're like a girl's hands. He says, oh. he goes, you know what that means? He went, well, he said, uh, he goes, don't matter how big I get, don't matter who I beat, he said, I'm never going to be able to fight Joe, Joe Louis. He said, and so his brother says, well, cool. he's a fucking heavyweight, you're a middleweight. And he said, well, I'm never going to be out of uh, fight the best. Right. So I nearly crumbled because, but, but basically, um, I'm going to take 50% of the blame. Um, I knew having left Chelsea, the only way was down. And I knew I was never going to play in the top flight again, unless we drew someone big in a cup tie. And it, it affected me enough. And it, and it's, um, the key word is realization. You know, I had that, I had that set that real like that. It, it hit me all at once, uh, just like a massive sense of realization that, that that was it. I was out of the top flight. I think the, the thing I the thing I was thinking, John, is in the film. I feel like I know I know you I know you said he has that moment, doesn't he, where he sort of like it seems to be all dawning on him. But I don't feel like he ever really gets it in the film. He he he, he misses it, doesn't he? He, he? he misses the point of life, and he misses. He's, he's through his pig headedness and his stubbornness, mm. he, he done. He, you can't root for him at the end of the day because he don't. He don't get it. And I feel like whether whether I've got this wrong or whether it's because you were forced to change your life or whether it was because you managed to twig it. When I listened to you talking about the birth of your kids and that earlier, and what and in your family and that, I feel like you you you, you do get it. Does that make sense? Is that is that right? Okay. Yeah, 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 but 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 I've, I've got so into you were like you were like him, but you're not like him. That's that's the impression I get. I'd say that's spot on. I'd say that's spot on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, particularly as a young man, particularly as a young man, and people try to guide me and help me, like Ray Wilkins at Chelsea. Uh, uh, Ken Shalata was very uh, like soft and very uh, much sort of guided discovery in his approach. Um, Dario Gotti was a bit more stern. Uh, Eddie McCready took me as I was and tried to nurture it and mould it by saying I should have been born a Scotsman. He said, I love, love the way you approach the game. Um, lovely little G up for a 16-year-old. Yeah. Ronnie Harris tried to help me. David A sat me down in the bath, in the communal bath at White Hart Lane after a reserve game. He tried to help me. He said, they obviously think a lot of you to make you captain the reserves at 18. Um, started to give me the do's and don'ts. Do you think I'd listen? Did I fuck? You know what I mean? Yeah. I was, um, I had an acute sense of right and wrong. And um, I, was, I was really, uh, I wouldn't say an animal, but I, like, no, I was. In a, I had an acute sense of right and wrong. And uh, and, I, I, and sort of the ability to meet out my own justice. You know what I mean? I did, honestly, I, I really, I did not give a fuck. At probably between the ages of 16 and 21. Then I got married and it calmed me down a little bit. And then when I got married, we had our first child when I was 28, it calmed me down a bit more. Mm-hmm. So you sound about me twigging it. Put it this way. If I'd have been as patient as a, as a coach, as I have been, as a, a black cab driver, I'd still be in the game. Mm-hmm. If I'd been as uh, outgoing, sociable, quick-witted, sharp-tongued, um, interactive, as a, uh, as a as a player at Chelsea, as I was as a cab driver, then I might have still been at Chelsea. 
um, so all these things about like that's what I mean by realization and what you said about like tw like twigging it. But sometimes it comes it comes to some people a little bit later than it does to others. And I think you're a product of your environment. Yeah. So that that would explain um, my life, and that would explain my my liking for raging bull. Nice, John. I can't thank you enough for your time today. And I know you said it was a bit tight up for time, and I've like taken up more of it than I promised I would as well. So thank you so much, and thank oh, you. It's nice, done. It's good. Yeah. If you'd like to find out more about today's guest or the Wonders of the World podcast, then you can check out our website or get involved in all the usual social media nonsense. Wonders of the World is a borderline niche production and we would just like to say thank you for listening.